So today I'm going to be talking about uh, privacy preserving public health infrastructure. So as you know, in the last uh, you know, few months, there's been quite a few efforts around um, uh, COVID-19 and building sort of privacy preserving applications and broader data infrastructure to help uh, society best respond to this pandemic. Um, and in particular, that's created lots of sort of privacy concern and, and, and people often, often asking the question, you know, what kind of tools do we have at our disposal? Um, and so today what I'll be talking about are the sort of big groups of use cases that, that are applicable to public health, especially to COVID-19, um, and then try to attach them to the different components and the different algorithms that are useful for these, these different these different use cases, and in particular, I'll call out um, areas where you can uh, look more into these into these tools um, and be able to investigate them for yourself. Um, but I think the, the most important takeaway from this talk uh, will be just a general understanding of um, sort of how do we think about these problems from both an efficacy and a privacy standpoint, and and sort of what you know what are ways that we can try to mitigate. Um, perceived trade-offs between efficacy and privacy, uh, and maybe also what are sort of the hard bounds? Like, what are the what are the ways where where we actually reach a legitimate legitimate trade-off? And if, if we do reach trade-off, how do we how do we navigate that? So, um, my name is is Andrew. Um, I lead a, an open source community called OpenMind. Uh, for the last several months, um, we have been uh, actively supporting uh, COVID nineteen um, based infrastructure projects. Uh, so, OpenMind is a community. It's almost three years old. In general, we focus on uh, lower, making the world more privacy preserving by lowering the barrier to entry to privacy preserving technologies. So, uh, we do kind of two groups of things uh, in our community. One, we create education around privacy enhancing tools, uh, and then we also build open source libraries. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, so, let's let's first start at the beginning. So, how do we actually formalize this problem that we're we're faced with as a community of technologists um, who would like to to assist uh, in the best ways that we can um, uh, with the with the, the COVID-19 effort. And um, in in consulting with a wide variety of projects um, and, and sort of listening to um, you know epidemiologists and, and public health experts um, and trying to sort of interface this with with tools that are available and what people actually want to be able to do with data. Um, the way that I see the problem is that there are actually two groups of problems that people care about. Right? So we can take sort of the, the overall general approach of, of, of helping to solve uh, the, for the pandemic and split them into these two groups. So, so there's one group of, um, of problems which are all about protecting health. So these are the ones that kind of first, first come to mind, obviously. So, so the idea being that we want to stop the disease. Right, um, and then the other group is around protecting the economy, and and unfortunately there is a little bit of a trade-off between these two groups of problems, and um, and we would like to be able to build tools that help us, can help us find the best possible trade-off between um, um, fighting the uh, fighting the disease and and fighting economic harms of, of the reduced level of activity um, in society due to the disease. So on the protecting health side. Um, you know, there's like obviously pre pre like preventing cases, like preventing people from being from getting sick. If someone does get sick, how do we detect this as a society um, and you know help inform them, for example, that they that they are likely to become sick? You know, how do we make sure everyone uh, gets tested? Um, then there's also distributing resources. So so one of the, the challenging problems for uh, societies, especially societies with limited access to um, PPE or testing kits or whatever, is like how do I know how to properly distribute these resources? Throughout society, so that it's it's done in, in sort of the best possible way, given that we have a limited amount. Um, this problem, uh, best use of limited health resources, is sort of like given that I have um, some level of resources that are distributed um, in, in in my situation. Like how how do we you know sort of, sort of flatten the curve and like do these other things that help make sure that we can get the most out of say the number of ICU beds that we have. Um, and then um, the last one is limit person-to-person -person contact with cases. So obviously, I think contact tracing is probably one of the most uh, talked about um, use cases here. And this is really about trying to say, like, hey, if someone is sick, how can we make it? How can we inform them and like help them socially distance um, with with sort of greater degrees of rigor, uh, so that they're unlikely to spread the disease to other individuals. Um, around protecting the economy. Um, you know, keeping people at work. Obviously, um, identifying at-risk groups. I think is probably one of the the fewer less talked about um, problems under protect the economy. So, so any response that we, we take um, to fighting the pandemic affects different parts of the population differently. Um, and so I think one of the things that's sort of not talked about quite as much is that technology can play a role in helping to identify groups that are, are um, perhaps being adversely or, or more likely to become hurt 
or, or, or displaced as a result of, of our response to, to the disease. Um, and of course, turning around and like leveraging this identification to then be able to support these at-risk groups. Um, and finally, um, how do we actually keep the economy going and get people both, you know, working and also still buying things, ideally from the same places, right? So, so um, it's not just about keeping people buying in the same amounts, but how can we make sure to say the, the same small businesses and same small business owners um, continue to be able to to have revenue? And so the the challenge here um, is that there are some very real trade offs, um, especially with with um, his, you know, historically valid ways of responding to public health crisis, such as you know mass quarantine being probably the best example. So, you know, if if you if you want to want to just stop the disease in its tracks, tell everyone to stay home for thirty days, and if everyone actually stayed home for thirty days, right, then then the disease would would pass, and and presumably it would be gone. However, the problem is we can't all stay home for thirty days. I mean, you know, just just doctors and nurses, for example, can't just stay out. Like the 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 the, the cost um, inadvertently would be extreme, and so some people have to go out, right? And um, um, but of course, if we did the exact opposite and and um, we just focused on protecting the economy and didn't do anything, the disease would spread and and there would be a great deal of harm. So we we see this sort of natural tension between these two these two groups of of problems. Um, and really, when we're investigating um, technological solutions, what we're really doing is we're trying to figure out how can we best facilitate um, the, 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 the best possible trade-off between these two, right? So, so for example, if, if people are going to stay at home, how can we make it so that it is, it is the fewest number of people possible while making sure that, that the ones who are staying home like, like they, they, we make sure that like everyone who actually is sick does stay home, for example, right? Um, um, and and one of the things that we should we should point out here is that that the the tools that are at society's disposal by default, sort of without any technological influence, are incredibly coarse grained, right? They're coarse grained and they're manual. And so I think that the the big theme. Um, so, so for example, like you know, uh, closing schools or opening schools, you know, closing bars or opening bars, um, um, curfew or no curfew, right? I mean, these are these are like um, incredibly blunt instruments that that aren't very good at pinpointing sort of people who are most likely to spread the disease, right? Which um, um, and also people who are most likely to be at risk of the disease uh, of catching it, right? So, so um, um, you know. One of the big themes in these the, the use of technology here is about um, starting with you know what society has by default, which are these sort of very blunt, policy-driven, sort of legal, uh, written word-driven um, restrictions, and getting more to like a fine-grained, continuous you know dial. So instead of a switch, like schools are open, schools are closed, how can we get to like a, a dial so that policymakers have a, a, just more options at their disposal for ways in which they can. Um, they can find the best trade-off between between um, protecting health, and protecting the economy, um, and then the um, the the other big group, um, or the sort of other big theme is around um, automating process. So, for example, there's a a great deal of of information collection that is still incredibly manual, you know, like people with clipboards, basically, right? Um, and and often this this means that there's a, a high degree of latency. In how fast information can flow, that then allows public health authorities to to update policy, and so I think these are sort of the 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 big themes that we're going to be looking at, um, and and these themes of, of technology are going to be applied to try to find the best possible trade off between um, health and 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 the economy. So um, now I want to jump into sort of the three big use case groups. Um, so I'll drill down a little bit into more what what you've probably heard of from a COVID specific perspective. Um, and there are, you know, there's a huge variety of apps and protocols and, and you know, cloud infrastructure and, and hybrid, you know, in-person digital approaches. Um, but in, in general, I, I think the, the three big groups that, that, that at least interface with, with um, privacy-enhancing technologies and indeed also have some of the biggest privacy, privacy uh, concerns and issues are these three big use cases. So first is survey, which is all about... Um, like so survey app, survey infrastructure is all about collecting information about the spread of the disease and the welfare of the population. So it's basically saying, all right, if you are a public health authority and you want to help respond, you just need, you need to be well informed, right? You know, how many people are sick? 
you know, where have these people been, right? How, how are they catching the disease? Um, but also, you know, who, who has been displaced? You know, how many people are, are unemployed? Are businesses about to close? Like all, all these kinds of things, right? So this is really about how can we make sure that people who are making decisions are making well-informed decisions? And there are, there are pieces of infrastructure that can be used to help make this, um, make this more efficient. Now, this is very different than um, notification. So if surveying is all about um, helping policymakers and public health experts um, um, make well-informed decisions, right? Notify is all about making individuals make well-informed decisions. So this is like, you know, I think I think um, um, exposure alerting. So if you're familiar with with the Apple Google protocol that was um, released, I guess wow, uh, a week, several weeks ago now. Um, this is really about um, uh, ex like notifying individuals when they might have been exposed to someone who, who had COVID. Um, it's also about notifying individuals about various opportunities that they might have to get help if they need it. So, you know, hotlines, all, all these kinds of things, like, like uh, what's, what's happening in, in their city. Um, but even, even notifying their own risk, risk level, like what, what's the risk that they are likely to spread to someone else or that, that um, um, yeah, that they could, they could harm someone else in their, in their family or in their community. Right? So, so surveying is, is about, um, you know, in a privacy-preserving way, gathering information to help public policy experts be well-informed. Notify um, is about, um, and, and, and like surveying is about, you know, modifying the behavior of, of, of public health experts to be, to be well-informed. Notify is, is about um, modifying behavior um, of public individuals by helping them be well-informed. Um, uh, and, you know, and help people to stay home when they want to. Um, passport um, is is um, about all about shared spaces. So there's a whole group of use cases, there's a group of applications that are being put together um, that are all about trying to say, okay, um, this whole all or nothing thing of like total quarantine or not total quarantine or like schools open or schools closed or restaurants open or restaurants closed is like, it's just too coarse, right? How, how can we use... Um, some form of process, um, whether it's paper-based or technology-based or whatever, um, to, to give to give a, more options than just on and off, right? And that's really what these 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 passports are are, are about. Um, cool. So let's 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 dive deeper into these each of these three use cases. And really, the the, the rest of this talk is just going to be about um, talking about each of these use cases individually, um, and then and then. Um, summarizing what they're trying to accomplish and the technologies that are relevant to, to, to accomplishing those goals. So first, let's talk about this survey use case. So um, all these use cases have dual public health and economic goals, right? So again, the, the, the goal here is, is to, to get the best possible trade-off between, between um, you know, the, the, the potential, um, you know, stopping the disease and, and protecting the, the welfare of, of individuals in our society and in our economy. Um, so on the public health side, um, the survey apps are all about empowering public health officials with information necessary to understand the spread of the disease and the resources able to counter it. So you know, we want to track the spread, where are people getting sick, or where have most people been when they get sick. So um, for context here, um, there is an app um, um, that has you know, uh, many millions of users um, that's actually able to predict hotspots for the disease 10 to 11 days uh, in, before they happen. And and this is really compelling, right? Because given given the uh, in many in many countries, the availability of, of PPE equipment or of, of test kits or various other resources is limited. Um, this allows you know this ability to actually predict where hotspots are going to be, allows for for um, people to be able to move these resources and to use them optimally, um, which I think has been. Um, so in, in particular, there is an app that is using um, um, GPS information to be able to to be able to do this. Um, but uh, second, and this is really about predicting the spread, right? So so and predicting the spread is is about um, understanding both where people are getting sick and also you know other other predictive information such as who is reporting symptoms, right? And like who are they who are they coming in contact with? So so um, you know even by hand contact tracing um, um, is trying to accomplish this goal. Um, and then finally, and this is a really interesting one. Being able to track resources. So, so um, the, from a public health standpoint, you you both want to know like how bad is it? Like what, what what's happening? What what are the harms? But also what what's the current state of what's at my disposal? Right? Do or, or, like given that we you know we have this this number of people who are getting sick, like how how are we doing on the on the you know, keeping track of like what resources we have available um, to us? And on the economic side, it's it's very similar. It's like you know like what what what. Uh, 
we want to track employment. Like, h- how many people are actually filing for unemployment in my area? You know, how many businesses are likely to close? You know, are, are there some subsets of my community that are particularly displaced? You know, are, for example, are, are um, frontline health workers able to find childcare? Right. Like, like these, this sort of being able to measure inequity, I think, is also one of the most overlooked uh, features, particularly in COVID-19 apps. Right. So there's there's lots of apps that will have some survey about whether you're getting sick or, you know, are you experiencing symptoms or whatever. But I haven't, I've seen far fewer um, apps that are focusing on like, hey, are, are you being displaced, right? You know, like, where are you in this quarantine business, right? You know, like, are, you know, how, how are you doing? I mean, obviously, you know, there have been programs that have disseminated um, checks in the mail and like this, this, this kind of thing. But, but um, I think we, we really, and there are helplines, I think are probably one of the, one of the, the, the better ways they're trying to sort of measure in, inequity. Um, but, but I don't even think we've gotten to the point where we can we can sort of predict inequity in the same that we can predict the spread because there's a lot of people focusing on on the spread as opposed to just people who are getting displaced. Um, and then finally, of course, you know what businesses are closing, what businesses are still available, um, and this obviously affects um, um, what's what's available. So, so you know, again, if if you're a public policy uh, official um, and y- you want to be able to to help protect the public health while also protecting the economy, basically, you need information infrastructure. To, to give you all the information that's necessary for you to make a good decision, right? And and that isn't just about understanding what's happening on the public health side. It's also about understanding what's happening on the economic side, right? You know, because oh, I'm I'm probably telling people to distance. I'm probably telling people to stay home, right? And and this is having some level of effect that's different across different communities and different across different members of the community. And unless unless you can have some sort of information supply for for both of these. Um, then, then you, you can't find the optimal trade-off. You, you you have to guess, and like, and that's that's not what we want, right? So I think um, 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 I think the technology can play uh, an interesting role here. So um, to cut straight to the chase of privacy-enhancing technologies that are kind of at the forefront of, of trying to uh, help this. So to be fair, like there there are lots of existing um, ways in which societies do this already, right? So so tracking the spread, like like hospitals have the ability to sort of report the number of, of of cases, you know, the, the number of deaths, um, um, and, and these kinds of things. Um, uh, there are people who do, you know, split second surveys of, or like 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 uh, sample surveys of people of how many people have symptoms in a given area. Um, but uh, you know, this is this is uh, primarily focused on on increasing efficiency, right? So these are generally pretty inefficient at aggregating this information, meaning there'll be some sort of delay, which makes it harder for public health officials to be able to react quite as quickly. And so this is where things like apps can be really, really helpful. And so if we want to do this in a privacy-preserving way, there are two algorithms that are generally useful, right? Because in, in, in both of these cases, we're doing some kind of survey across um, across our community. And we're either asking questions relating to the disease and, you know, are you sick? Where have you been? Like all, all these kinds of things. You know, are you experiencing symptoms? Or we're asking questions regarding the economy. But in, in both cases, this is some kind of survey. That we are we are putting together, and if we're going to do survey, there are two broad types of algorithms that are useful for doing surveys in a privacy-preserving way. The first one, which is the most mature, is called differential privacy. Um, I won't go into exactly what differential privacy is now. There are other resources online that I think are, are more appropriate for that. Um, but the um, um, to, to to sum up, what differential privacy does is, in particular, local differential privacy allows each person to add a small amount of noise. To their data before they report it, um, and what this does is that it means that that you know, let's say for example, you ask for someone's age. Um, you know, I'm 29, so I might add a random number between negative 20 and 20 to my answer, right? So, I'll, so some random number will generate it, and I'll report that my age is 21, right? And um, um, now, at first, it might seem like, oh, well, that that's that's going to damage my statistics. That's going to make things less accurate. That's true. But if you average over enough people, um, then the, the noise that you're adding will actually cancel out, right? And you'll still end up, on average, getting to the same result in the end. So if you're only surveying 10 people, yeah, this could be damaging, right? But if you're surveying 1,000 people, 10,000 people, um, then, then differential privacy can be an ex- exceptionally useful way to make it so that you don't ever have to handle um, the true raw records of your population, um, however, however, you can still gain useful insights about you know the health and welfare of of a population of people, right? 
Now, there's also another um, group of algorithms that tries to do this without adding noise. So you can get basically the exact answer uh, while, without ever actually seeing any individual person's individual record. And this is called secure aggregation. So whereas um, differential privacy does have a host of libraries, that, so these are ones that we're working on, um, the reason that I list these specifically is that um, we've taken what I think is the, remote, the most robust differential privacy library, sort of component library from Google, which is a C++ library, and we've wrapped it and packaged it in languages that are necessary for use in iPhone apps. So this is like uh, uh, iPhone and Android apps, and uh, whether they're JavaScript-based or iPhone and Android. And, and so I, I think... Um, um, and, and we have active teams that are focused on consulting and helping apps be able to, COVID apps specifically, um, be able to install these into their apps. So, so I highly encourage you, if you do want to add differential privacy to your survey mechanism so that you don't have to handle individual person data, which I highly recommend is, is a step that you take, um, then um, just check out one of these libraries. Um, um, inside, inside the readmes, you'll see ways to get in touch with the team. Um, you can also message me uh, as well. Um, and uh, uh, we can help you get set up. Now, on the secure aggregation side, this actually performs um, what, what is something called encrypted computation. Encrypted computation is really special because it allows um, it allows you to, to compute on data while it's encrypted. Um, so, so in in particular for secure aggregation, it allows a large group of people to encrypt their their um, their answer right in such a way that um, when all the answers are combined into the final result, you know, the average age of a group of 10,000 people. Um, the only way to, de like, uh, the, the, the person running the survey only ever decrypts the result and never sees the individual record. So it's almost like, you know, if, if you wanted to conduct a survey of um, 10,000 people, right, um, uh, you know, each of them take their age, so I'm 29, I would take my, my, my age, the number, I would encrypt it, and I would give it to you, and then once you had collected that from 10,000 people and added those numbers together while they were still encrypted, you could decrypt the result. So it's, it's a really um, clever algorithm. Unfortunately, um, um, I don't have a good go-to um, library to provide or recommend that is ready to do this at scale on mobile phones. Um, and the, the algorithm, I think, is like largely there. Like people know how these algorithms work, um, but there's not a good implementation. Um, the real barrier is actually a com combination between the algorithm and peer-to-peer -peer communications um, between phones, because unfortunately, it actually requires phones to talk directly to each other. Um, the infrastructure for this is actually wor uh, a work in progress at OpenMind, um, but it's not done yet. It's not ready for, for prime time, but it is the kind of thing that... Um, uh, just to make you aware of it, right? And and you know, if if another group is able to come out of the woodwork with secure aggregation, that would be really fantastic. Um, um, but as it stands at the moment, um, differential privacy is sort of the best the best way to to go for it. Cool. Let's talk about the second use case. So the first case, use case is all about notifying uh, public policy and, and public health ex uh, experts for for a given region with information that is necessary for them to make good decisions. Um, this next use case is all about notifying individuals so that they can be well informed and help them make good decisions. So on the public health side, um, we want to empower individuals with information about the risk that various decisions they make could harm the health of themselves and others, right? So this is all about, you know, so exposure notification is, I think, really, really popular one. So this is like, hey, hey you know, someone gets a push notification on their phone or a phone call from a contact trace that says, hey, we think that there's a good chance that you've been exposed to someone who has COVID-19. Um, you know, please self-isolate, this kind of thing. And this is really about empowering someone with, with information so that they know to, to stay inside and distance themselves from others, right? Secondarily and related to this um, is a risk scoring system. So I think we first saw this um, um, in China's response to, to, to COVID-19 uh, where individuals were given a color um, and that color um, indicated um, basically their level of risk to society and around them. And, 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 and um, somewhat controversially in, in China, that was also linked to um, um, your ability to sort of access uh, public spaces, right? So, so often um, this notification is somehow somewhat tied to to a passport-like app, but it can be it can be independent of that. It can also be like a hey, um, we think that there's this probability that you that you um, uh, have have contracted COVID, um, and and thus you're, the likelihood that you're a risk to someone else um, is X. Um, and the likelihood that you, you know, risk, to, risk to self is, is why. So in particular, the risk to self is really about uh, hotspotting locations. So, so there's a handful of apps that focus on 
or proposed apps, I should say, that focus on um, um, making aware, making people aware of hotspots in their area so that they can avoid them, basically. Um, but but really, um, um, this kind of notification is actually, I think, best done um, more in general, just like through general like um, good policies. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna go here, wear a mask. If you're gonna if you're gonna go here, mask not really necessary. You know, if you're walking in a park, maybe maybe things are different than if you are going to be indoors in a lobby of a dentist or something like that, right? So I think some of this is like um, conditioned on external information, and some of this is might just be like good general advice, right? The other goal of notification, um, and again, um, there are people who work on, on this, but often it's decoupled from people who work on, say, exposure notification. Like it tends to be, there's like a lot of these apps are sort of focused on individual small use cases, when in reality, what a public health system actually wants is kind of a suite of, of all these, these different ways to both aggregate information to make good decisions and disseminate information so that individuals can be well informed. And I think one of the most useful ones is really just where to find services, like some sort of up-to-date way to know what's open, what's closed, you know, what are the helplines if I have mental or physical, um, uh, like mental health problems or, or more physical well-being might be might be in danger, like where do I go to get tested if I think I need to get tested, um, um, what stores are open and closed, when's the bank open and are closed, you know, are there are there special hours for, for um, grocery stores in my area for people who are elderly or particularly at risk. Um, uh, all, all these kinds of things, right? And so, so this kind of infrastructure is all about just making sure that individuals are are well informed. And there are a couple of algorithms that are useful for this as well. So, um, the big one I want to make you aware of is private set intersection. So, private set intersection is particularly useful when you want to trigger an alert without centralizing user data. So, let me give you an example. Um, um, this isn't my favorite example, but I think it's the most intuitive example. So, this, which is why I'm going to explain it this way. So um, let's say that you wanted to um, alert someone when they have um, crossed, when they, when they have uh, um, um, recently been in a location that um, uh, a, a, um, a COVID positive person has been. Right, so so presumably a person is keeping track of their own GPS locations, and they, they maybe they have them on their phone or something like this. Um, and there's a server that has GPS locations of someone who got sick, right? Um, the cool thing about private set intersection is that it allows someone's phone and a server to each have a list of, of items, in this case, GPS locations, and to calculate whether any of the items in those lists are the same, okay? Without either of them having to send their list to each other, right? which means the server doesn't have to tell the client, you know, everywhere that a patient has been, right? And the client, you know, the, someone's phone, doesn't have to centralize all of their, their location data to the server, right? Um, so, so, you know, if you remember, um, I think it was in um, South Korea or Singapore. Uh, no, I think it was, it was South Korea's contact tracing app. Um, um, very, very early on, um, they were just like publishing, you know, where all the sick people had been. And there were several people who were de-anonymized through that process. Um, and I think there might have been like one like suspected affair that was like in the news um, that was de-anonymized from people looking at the location data where people had been. Because you know your location data, it's it's very indicative about who you are, like you know, where you sleep and where you work, right? Is 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 very relatively unique information. Um, and so um, if they had instead employed private set intersection, people could check whether they cross paths. With, with locations that are on the server without ever learning the locations on the server or having to divulge their own. Right? This is the essence of private set intersection. And it works not just for GPS locations, but for, but for any real sets of things. So if, if the server has um, some information that you want to use to alert individuals um, without disclosing that, that information directly and without requiring the individuals to disclose their information to the server, this is where private set intersection is useful. Right? And there's a, a host of other ways that I think are actually a lot more applicable than the example that I just gave that typically have to do with the guts of, of some other messaging um, algorithm or platform, uh, often has to do with scalability. Um, um, and so I guess the thing that I would like to call out, like if anyone needs private set intersection um, for the last several months, we've had a team focused, again, some of the differential privacy um, on making private set intersection um, in its, in its you know, state-of-the-art algorithms um, available in a wide variety of, of languages, and, and we help and advise and consult on apps, uh, helping them to, to install it. So um, yeah, that's private set intersection.
Now, on the notification side, there's also two other um, groups of technologies that I think are, are really interesting. One of them, I'm going to call it end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. Um, um, but this also includes like like the Apple and Google kind of find my based um, uh, uh, contact tracing or like a, a, a um, alerting system that, that they've that they've done, like the Bluetooth based one you might have heard of. Um, the, and the reason I call this end-to-end -end encrypted messaging is that, that what's really happening when you when you walk around and your your phone is is broadcasting um, you know random random numbers. Um, um, what, uh, uh, what what that's actually doing is it's it's basically creating a bunch of you know every time you broadcast a number a number it's a lot like broadcasting like a a single use email address right and and what someone can do if is if they if they're near you and they they collect that number they can then send a message um, encrypted in a way that only you can read to a central server right and this is basically like an encrypted email bo in inbox that only you can read um, and so. In my mind, I, I like to think about this as sort of anonymous end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, where it's like someone, if they're in physical proximity of you, th has the ability to send you exactly one specific kind of message, which is, I got sick, right? Um, and if you receive that message from someone in one of your encrypted mailboxes, you know, the addresses for which you were broadcasting over Bluetooth, then you know that you were near someone who, who might have gotten sick, right? Um, obviously, if you want to do other kinds of end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, and, and like there are there are... Basically, there are a bunch of use cases that just like bump up against the need to do end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. So, so for example, actually, this secure aggregation is, an, is another one of them, like the ability to, to have um, communications direct from one phone to another phone without the central server being able to read them, right? Um, um, you, can, you can look at developer APIs for things like WhatsApp. And of course, there's, other, there's two, two other protocols proposed by TC and DP3T that are very close to the one that Apple and Google ultimately, ultimately adopted. Um, so you can, you can highly recommend those. Now, the one that... Um, I also wanted to call as being particularly interesting, and it's sort of similar to this, is that a QR code approach that Covey ID has been working on. Um, and this QR code approach is particularly um, uh, incredible because, so, so Covey ID um, is a, uh, um, a really fantastic team based in South Africa, and, and one of the challenges that they face um, in trying to be able to notify people that they might have been exposed um, is that most of their country, I think it's like uh, some, some extremely high percentage of their country doesn't have a smartphone. Um, and so they, they can't use so you know the this Apple Google Find My algorithm, and so they they've developed basically a QR code based approach, where everywhere you go, um, you end up receiving bits of paper that are QR codes for locations that you've been, right? And so like this is like stores and businesses and banks and all sorts of stuff, right? And you just you just keep these receipts, right? And the cool thing about you keeping these receipts is that one you have your data on paper right in front of you, and each one of these receipts has a QR code on it, right? And then if you get sick. Um, you then um, basically bring these QR code receipts to you know with you with you to the doctor, um, and and um, these can be used to basically inform um, 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 uh, other folks of, of areas and parts of town that might have had um, uh, ex been exposed to you. If this makes sense. Now it doesn't have a, a messaging capability built in where you can actually directly message everyone else who was in these places at the same time. Um, but it does uh, give this kind of breadcrumb um, trail of where you've been recently that can be very useful for helping, um, you know, the, in the contact tracing approach. So I think I think it's it's a, it's a really clever idea, um, and from 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 a um, usability standpoint, um, sort of universal usability standpoint, and a privacy standpoint, and an efficacy standpoint, it's an, it's a nice trade off and an interesting interesting twist of technology. Okay, so um, the first two use cases we talked about were the first was like the group of use cases that are about informing policymakers to make good decisions. The second one is about informing individuals so that they can make good decisions. Um, and then this last one, which I think is probably the most um, the most challenging um, from from a from a wide variety of of perspectives, um, are these group of technologies that are trying to do something along the lines of a passport. Um, and when we see I mean a passport, we mean something that has these kinds of goals. So on uh, the public health goal, um, the, the, the goal is to measure the risk that someone will spread a disease if they enter a particular space. Um, so, so I really want to emphasize this, like measuring the risk. Like a, a passport, you know, we think about a passport as, you know, it's kind of a loaded term, right? Because it has an existing meaning, which is which has to do with like citizenship and access and this, this kind of thing. Um, but what a passport in the context of public health should really be about it should be really about um, um, empowering the city to find the best possible trade-off between um, you know, health and economic costs um, around 
access to shared spaces, right? Because basically diseases spread in shared spaces. That's the only the only place, the only way that they can spread are when two people come into contact with each other or when two people come into contact with the same space. And and like both of these have to happen in, in, in some sort of some sort of shared space, whether that's a home or or um, or a place of business or public park or whatever, right? And so in particular for public spaces, um, the 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 goal of the passport type of, of, of technology and the goal of this use case is to um, is to, to be able to measure the risk that someone is going to spread the disease if they enter, right? And make decisions based on that risk, right? And so we, we, we measure this risk based on two things, the likelihood that someone is contagious, right? And the likelihood that their role in that space is conducive to spreading, right? So, you know, how likely are they contagious? And, you know, are they a chef? <laughs> Or are they, you know, loading boxes or driving a truck, right? A truck driver um, not coming into contact with a ton of people, right? But someone who is, you know, making, you know, flipping burgers coming into contact with, you know, loads of, of ways to potentially spread it, right? And, they, and, and, and presumably lots of people are coming through, right? So, so this is really about a building infrastructure to quantify someone's contagiousness risk and quantifying that particular venue risk given that person's role, um, in that venue, right? So let's just say you're able to quantify this, right? Secondarily, you also want to be able to quantify um, what's the economic cost and or, or gain of this person being able to enter this space, right? You know, and the first one is like, is it on-site essential, right? Like nurses, doctors, chefs, right? They, they can't do their job unless they are actually physically in the building, right? Um, and so like, but there's a whole host of jobs that don't need to be on-site. And I think these have also been some of the ones where people have, have chosen to work from home relatively relatively early. But for example, if you wanted to create a passport, you know, you you don't want to put everyone into the same passport system. You, you probably want to have some ability to 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 af uh, affect um, how open a location is based on um, how essential someone's uh, entering of that location actually is, right? And, and secondarily, of course, and this is this is the real kicker, the, the really important one. What is the financial cost of the individual and their community if the person is not allowed in? And when I say financial cost, I guess we, we should probably make this like like general cost. So I'll, I'll delete the dollar sign, right? This is this is like what what is what is the true cost to the individual and their community if the person is not allowed in? Um, in the sense that like is this business going to close if this person is not allowed in, or um, if this if if you know if kids aren't allowed to go to school, like does that mean their their you know their parents can't go work at the hospital? Right, um, and quantifying this is, is incredibly difficult. Um, but there, but there are areas in which technology can 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 play a role. And doing all this in a privacy preserving way, I think, is actually actually quite interesting. So, first things first. Um, at a high level, passport use cases um, seem to be pretty easy to get damn near perfect privacy. And the reason for that is that. Um, Basically, all this information um, is more or less locally storable on someone's device, right? You should be able to do all of this without centralizing any data anywhere, right? And that, that, that is like a big deal. And the two tools that matter the most are QR codes, right? QR codes that are displayed either by a device or on paper, and cryptographic signatures, okay? Um, so QR codes, for those of you who don't know, allow you to basically convey some digital information in the form of an image. And someone else can take a picture of that image and, and um, that will convey just some, some level of information. It's, it's literally, it's just, it's, it's, um, you can think of it like a little mini USB drive, but it's, you, can, you can communicate it via picture. And this is really useful because lots of people basically know how to use QR codes. Everyone who has a phone um, has it, but you can also print them on paper. Um, and this is like a, like a good thing. Um, and the for cryptographic signatures, um, this is a little bit more, more challenging to to um, to explain. But the reason the cryptographic signatures are really interesting is that they allow um, uh, for what's called a credential or or a claim of truth or or simply a claim uh, around a piece of document. So or around a document. So let's let's say for example, I go get a test um, for COVID. Uh, I test negative, um, and now. Um, this, we want to use this test to say that I should be allowed in high-risk areas, such as a nursing home, right? Because I've tested negative very recently, so we have some, some degree of belief that I am, um, that I am sort of in a low-risk category. Um, the problem with this is that then this, this, um, 
this becomes a commodity. Like, it, like people have a reason to cheat. People have a reason to to forge um, um, a document that says that they can also go into the nursing home, you know, and visit visit grandma. And um, so, what a cryptographic signature allows you to do is it basically allows you to create. Um, well, kind of what it sounds like, a cryptographic signature. It's like it's like a doctor signing your piece of paper, except it's really, really, really hard to forge. Like, impossible to forge. Um, I mean, I mean, not totally impossible, but like like really, 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 really hard. Uh, like, you would need big compute for like a long time to, to be able to do it or something like this, right? And um, so the cool thing is that um, whenever you have a, a, a digital asset, such as, such as a, a claim from a doctor that says, this person tested negative, right? You can take this, you can you can hash that claim, which it basically means convert to a number in a deterministic way, and then a doctor can can in theory sign it cryptographically, which which literally hand you a big random number that has a certain property, and that that big random number that the doctor is handing you, um, um, random looking number, um, um, is able to encode like encode in such a way that doctor's signature that no one else could forge specifically about that specific claim. So that when you go to the the receptionist at the nursing home and you show her you know a QR code that has that number in it, and she scans it with her app, she can go, oh, I see that someone has said that you are in this risk bucket. Possibly not even like that. That person might not even say um, someone has said that you're COVID negative, right? Like, like the 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 because of the way these these cryptographic signatures work, right? And like so, this um, if you are um, a business leader, or you're a public policy person, or whatever, and you hear someone um, working on a project with QR codes and cryptographic signatures, I think that th this is this, they're probably on the right trail, right? And and in in looking at like a host of different apps that are that are working in this in this space, um, in particular, I want to call out sort of self sovereign identity or trust over IP. Like some people look into this. Um, it's a fancier form of cryptographic signature. From the libraries that I've seen, it doesn't seem like it's quite ready for prime time yet. Like it's a very good idea. I'm really supportive of the community, but in terms of like 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 shipping out to millions of people, you know, this week or next week, right? I I, I haven't seen an implementation that is is really really ready. Um, and it also seems like that basically people storing information on their own phones or on pieces of paper specifically storing cryptographic signatures from trusted authorities proving things about their life so that they can claim in person that they are that they are low risk or medium risk or or, or high risk right if you want to be able to claim that um, um, that that is um, that is the way to do passports if you're going to do passports why because it means that you aren't centralizing any information right right no no one is obtaining information you know at a high level about you right it means that it's paper compatible which means every, everyone can do it um, and it's built on technologies that are that are incredibly robust, right? And it's got consent built in, right? A person can choose to show it to you or not choose to show it to you, right? And so I think these are really, really important properties, and and these tend to, to make for um, apps and infrastructure that I think are likely to be successful. Um, and so finally, let's just, before I finish, let's just zoom back out um, and, and, and consider these three groups of use cases. So I know this has been um, um, perhaps a, a bit of a long talk, but um, when we consider these three things together, um, we really are looking at sort of a, a cohesive um, flow of information that's trying to get society to be able to to make good decisions and to find the best possible trade-off between economic and epidemic harms. Um, and this is really about making sure that public, public policy um, uh, individuals are well informed, right? Without them being able to know information about individuals, right? Which we can do through through differential privacy um, and one day through secure aggregation. We want to be able to notify individuals. Um, uh, about you know what risk categories they might be in through a combination of on-device computation and private set intersection if if that notification is conditioned on, on some other private information um, and then finally we want to be able to aggregate information you know the, the combination of, of sort of global information about society and local information about uh, things about an individual like you know certificates that they have about themselves things that they can prove um, to, to limit access to shared spaces as efficiently as possible, meaning, meaning that we don't want to just open schools or close schools or open society or close society, right? We want to be able to find the, 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 the only, you know, the smallest number of times that we have to actually sort of restrict access to high-risk areas specifically for people who are most likely to be contagious while still leveraging our survey information to take into account individuals who might be displaced, right? 
So like like there's 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 sort of like three things we're actually balancing there. It's like individual sort of welfare and liberty, right? Um, the and the and privacy and the and the um, um, and the ability to stop the disease, right? And these are these are very real things. There's no simple answer, um, but and, and we as technologists should not be trying to prescribe an answer um, to, to what those are. Instead, what we should be focused on is making sure that everyone who, who is responsible for making that answer and everyone who is responsible for making decisions both is as well informed as possible and has as many options as possible, right? So these these two are all about making each member of society as well informed as possible, right, in a privacy preserving way. And then this one is really about um, opening up more options other than just businesses are open, businesses are closed. You can leave your home, you can't leave your home, right? Like it, it's just about granular options in between, right? It's, it's not about, it's not about um, 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 like, like, you know, it's, it's not about anything uh, that, that is, is um, um, yeah, any, any different, any different from that. So um, yeah, I hope, I hope this has been at least an interesting context for you when considering uh, privacy enhancing technologies and their role in public health infrastructure, especially as it relates to COVID, uh, COVID-19. Please reach out if, if I can be helpful or Open Minds community can be helpful in any way. Again, we are here to answer questions and to help and to consult on people wanting to leverage uh, privacy enhanced technologies in the context of COVID apps. Um, and uh, yeah, you can, you can find, find me on Open Mind. Um, so we have a Slack team, openmind.slack.org. Um, and shoot me a message and uh, um, I'll be happy to help.